We got Cody Stamen back here on the program. He's going to be taking on Alejandro Perez at UFC 235 on March 2nd. Cody, what's going on, man? How are you? Uh, man, I'm great. How are you? I bet you're doing great, man. A huge card you're going to be on UFC 235. My uh, my buddy Mike Heck, I saw the interview you did and uh, where, you, where you know kind of broke the news that you were on this card. When did you actually find out about this fight? For those who don't know, because uh, you know this is a short notice fight for you. So this is about exactly four weeks. Short notice, yeah, but not not that short notice in comparison to some other fights that I've had. I've had a lot of short notice fights in my career. Uh, four weeks, really. It's plenty of time to get ready, and not only that, I had actually been planning on fighting uh, March 23rd, so I'd already been in fight camp, so everyone keeps talking about short notice, but for me, I feel like I've been in fight camp since my last fight, just because I lost, and um, I've been doing everything I can to make sure that never happens again. That fight was in September, and uh, you know we're talking about a fight in, in March. Um, were you trying to get on cards? What was sort of the reason for, for that gap? And I know Darren fought, so I'm sure that was part of it, too. You wanted to you know, be in his corner. So there were a, a bunch of opportunities. When Dominic Cruz got hurt, I was going to step up and fight John Moniker. Um, when uh, after you know Jimmy Riviere and I fought on the same card, we were potentially going to fight in December. Uh, but he ended up going with Aljamain Sterling a little later on. So, I mean, there's been talks of uh, then I was maybe going to fight Rob Font March 23rd. I've had several, several different um, opportunities. None of them panned out. Uh, it wasn't because I said no um, for whatever reason the UFC or uh, my opponent didn't, you know, didn't like the matchup, and no, nothing, uh, nothing stuck. But uh, when I got the phone call about Alejandro Perez, I was honestly – kind of unsure just because I'd been told no so many times, you know, five, six times in a row. And I said, yeah, of course, I'll fight him. You know, I've said yes to pretty much every single guy on the roster. Of course, I'm going to fight him. Um, and then I'll suddenly have a contract in my email. I'm like, oh, well, this is going to happen. Okay, let's go. Okay. And did you, I mean, when you fought on the regional scene, I mean, uh, did you expect this to, to happen in the UFC where, you know, so many fights would fall through? Because it's common on the regional scene, but in the UFC, it doesn't usually, you, you don't usually have this much bad luck finding an opponent. So I think there's there's just a lot of things going on. I think a lot of times there's a there's a list of, of potential opponents, you know, for a guy on a different card. Um, and I think my manager's just doing the best he can to get me every single opportunity. Uh, you know, I might not be the first choice for that fight, but if number one, two, and three say no, uh, I might be the only guy left. So I think he was just trying to, you know, plug me anywhere he could. He know he knew how bad. Uh, I really wanted to get in there and uh, kind of put the loss behind me. Yeah, and l let's talk about that fight against uh, Aljamain Sterling, UFC 228. I, this is rare. You know, I, this is the first time you and I have done an interview where we're talking about a, a loss. Um, you know, what what happened in that fight? What did you take away from that performance? Oh, uh, I said I, bet, I had a bad night. I had a really bad night, and I, this doesn't happen very often. Uh, I've watched that fight, you know, a thousand times, and... You know, in conclusion, there were a, a few small mistakes here and there, but in my head, I really just think I had a bad night. I think I, I just didn't show up. I didn't do what I've trained to do, what I know I'm capable of doing. Um, you know, my body really wasn't wasn't doing what I wanted, and you know, I shit the bed. Period. I, I, I don't, I don't have any excuses. I don't really have. I can't blame anyone in my training camp or say I had an injury. I just didn't show up, and, you know, that's the one thing we all talk about. You know, you can be as good as you want in the gym. You can be as well prepared as you want, but, you know, when they shut that cage door, you got to show up, and you got to show up 15 minutes or, or less. Or, you know, however, however long the fight takes place, you have to be 100% prepared and ready for anything that happens, and I was like a deer in headlights out there, and I've, I've never been that way. You know, I'm, in my eyes, I was, I was, you know, 17 straight. I hadn't lost, you know, 18 straight. In my professional career, I had one, you know, kind of crappy split decision before that, but it's been a long time since I lost, and honestly, uh, you know, I kind of forgot what it felt like, uh, and then after it happened, and I was like, wow, this is, this is brutal, I'm not, this isn't happening again, this is why I work so hard, and, uh, you know, it's done nothing but motivate me to, uh, to take my game to the next level and just want to be that much better for this, this fight. 
And there's no easy fights in the UFC. You're taking on Alejandro Perez. Uh, he's, he's got a great record. One of the most underrated guys in the division, in my opinion, a guy that doesn't get enough due. How do you feel like you match up against him here? Well, in comparison to all the matchups I've had in, in the UFC, I feel like he is the, the best matchup for me just because he's an orthodox guy and he's the same height. Doesn't have a crazy reach. Um, isn't really much of a grappler. He's going to want to stand and trade with me. Uh, and I fought guys like that, like Terrian Ware and, and Tom Dukenois. Uh But, you know, those are the two guys that I think that um, are closest to, you know, kind of how he is. Uh, but I also think that, you know, him not being as tall is going to be a huge advantage for me. I've I've only fought guys that are taller and, and you know, specific strikers. You know, Terrian Ware had like 72-inch reach. Uh, I, fought, I fought a lot of guys like Alejandro Perez in my fighting career. Um, never in the UFC, but those kind of guys outside of the UFC, I have absolutely beat the shit out of them. So uh, I look at Alejandro Perez the exact same way. Um, I think he's really good. I think he does a lot of things really well, but uh, everything he does well, I do a lot better. And not only that, I can take him down whenever I want. I mean, he's got pretty good. He's pretty good at not getting held down. I don't really think this isn't going to be a, a lay and pray thing. Um, but I think at any point in that fight, if I want to pick him out and drop him on the side, I will do it. And, uh, you know, I just, his strike is pretty one-dimensional. I don't really see, I don't really see any thing that he does that I can't handle. Morale must be pretty good at camp right now. You've got a lot of teammates fighting on that lights out card uh, coming up here pretty soon. Um, does that help heading into this fight? Just having guys also getting ready for fights? Oh, of course. Of course. That's why, I mean, that makes it so much, so much nicer. Yeah, we got... Uh, Ken Cross, Chad Decker, and Hassan, they're all fighting uh, this Saturday night uh, for KOP. So, you know, having having a bunch of guys that are kind of in the same place you are, it makes things uh, so much easier. There's more guys in the gym, more guys, uh, different mentality. And that's, uh, that's really important when it comes to, you know, in preparation for a fight, you know, so... We'll go Saturday, and this is something that's you know not uncommon for me. Uh, there's been so many times when I like, like I would you know go to fights three weekends in a row, and then I would go to my fight, and I like that because it kind of puts me in that in that atmosphere, and I have the you know the right mindset going into uh, going into the cage. How do you see this fight uh, playing out on March second? March second, well, I really think I'm gonna absolutely steamroll uh, Perez. Uh, I don't think there's anything that he can do uh, that I, like I said, I can't handle. There's, I mean, he throws a good low kick. He, he's got got a good stiff jab, uh, but I'm on a different level. I'm on a whole different level than he is, and I'm going to prove that to everybody. Uh, I feel like this is a fight that you know potentially put a lot of eyeballs on me, and and this he's like the perfect matchup. I'm telling you, when I when I got his name, I was. Uh, you know, I didn't want to get too excited, but I was like, this is the guy. This is the guy that I can really put a show on against, you know, because I've had a lot of, I fought a lot of weird guys. You know, every single guy I fought has been kind of a, a stylistic nightmare for me. Um, and he's the only guy I've ever fought where I'm like, dude, I could really, really put on a sweet show. I mean, I could, I could get a bonus in fight. And that's the kind of fight I, I, I've, I've really been wanting and just, I, I haven't gotten it, and, and now it, everything's finally coming through, and uh, yeah, I look for a highlight. And, and where do you feel like a win over Perez puts you? Does that, in your opinion, get you back in the driver's seat, sort of where on, on the momentum you were going uh, before the loss? I don't really know that. I think anytime you beat someone in the top 15, uh, it makes you, it kind of helps build a foundation, you know, for your career. Anytime you beat a guy that's ranked, you know, it definitely is a, it's a game changer. Uh, and, and I think everyone's eyes are kind of legitimized you. view. You know, when I beat Caraway, that was kind of like the fight that kind of cemented me as, as someone that's actually a threat in the anime division. Um, so, you know, I win over him. That's, that's exactly what it does. It just, it just puts, you know, a little bit more concrete on the ground uh, for me, you know, moving forward. Say, like, yeah, this guy's the real deal. Uh, and, you know, after Perez, you know, who knows? I mean, I'm, there's, literally, there's literally not a guy on that UFC roster that I won't fight. So, uh yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready for Perez and, and anything else you have to throw my way. 
Before we let you go here, uh, obviously you're a proud guy uh, from Michigan, uh, but but some unfortunate news. Uh, it looks like KOP, uh, the promotion that uh, you know Matt Frendo used to run, um, Josh Medley, who, who now uh, you know is sort of the man behind it, uh, they're going to be on UFC Fight Pass, and I think a lot of people don't know, uh, at least you know from from that that aren't in the know, that uh, you know Josh Medley has been accused of being a racist, and and the, the proof's in the pudding and everything else. Uh, just your reaction when you heard that KOP got on UFC Fight Pass and that they're still doing shows, not even a year removed from this whole incident that happened last year i mean that whole incident was nasty for michigan and may right it, it it really cast a really dark shadow uh over everyone and, and you know no one respects somebody that's saying stuff like that about about athletes uh that's i mean that's sad you know that could easily have been you know i mean those guys that he was talking about too but these guys are my friends you know so obviously i don't have any respect for the guy you know seeing and what he said, but the fact that he got UFC fight pass, I just don't understand. You know, I feel like somebody clearly doesn't know what's going on. You know, I think if uh, if everyone had the facts, uh, you know, that wouldn't be happening. But I don't think that everyone has the facts, and I think there's just a there's a communication gap. You know, and I think it's up to it's up to somebody to to, to fill the UFC and everybody in on you know kind of what's what's been going on in Michigan MMA. Um, you know, I said it's not. Like I said, it's, it's not a good. It's not a good look. It's not a good look for Michigan MMA. It's not a good look for anybody. Um, and somebody needs to do something about it. You know, whether that that's me or you or, or anybody. Uh, you know, you you can't you can't do those things and treat people that way and, and still like run a business. That's not that's not how it works. Yeah, and, and just to clarify a few things. First off, this wasn't just one incident. There, there's you know n- multiple incidences of his, him using the N word towards uh, you know African American fighters, and then it's it's just the fact that there wasn't really much of an apology either. And 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 like I said, it's not even a year old. Um, you know when this happened. Uh, you know for for those who don't know, the promotion kind of went away for a bit. Then they resurfaced earlier this year. Uh, Joe Riggs was actually on the card, and uh, you know they're still promoting events. And I think that's the big thing here is that you know it was it was a bad look, and it, there's no responsibility taken. And I think that's really what makes things worse and that there's no, uh, you know, remorse for something that is just absolutely horrible. Like no one should stand for racism. And I think that's kind of what we're both saying here that, you know, the UFC needs to be aware of this. If they're going to air this promotion on Fight Pass, the guy who's running it is a racist. There's no other way to look at it. Yeah. I mean, once you, well, once you get, you get caught saying things like that, I mean, there's really, like, you, you can't, you can't come, you can't come back from that. You can't come back in the sport and you can't, uh, the, the only thing you can do is apologize and repent for the things that you did. You know, he, he he really, he didn't. That's the worst thing about it. He should have made it right. He should have confronted those people and been like, listen, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an idiot. I messed up. You know, I was a, I was a, I was a luster man at, at these times, and, you know, I want to apologize, and he should have done it publicly or uh, privately or however he did, but to the best of my knowledge, he didn't, he didn't do that, and that's, that makes it even worse. I mean, that makes you a freaking racist and a coward. You know, if you mess up, you got to, you got to step up and uh, and own those mistakes and and do everything you can to make it right and not that you really can in this situation but uh, yeah it's a it's a shit deal. Good to see your support behind uh, you know going against that Cody uh, it's it's great and uh, we're really looking forward to this card it's coming up here March second it is UFC two thirty five uh, just to remind people where they can find you on social media and I'm sure you have some sponsors or shoutouts so the floor is yours. Uh, everything's just Cody Stamen. Uh Yeah, I gotta thank uh, you know Ed Knapp, uh, everyone at Iridium Sports, Jason House, uh, Jake, everybody. Uh, those guys are taking care of me. Uh, everyone at Michigan Top Team, my teammates, Darren Cookshank, Caro. Everybody's been uh, been just whatever I need for this for this camp. I mean, it's like hands and feet. I feel like uh, I feel like I might be extra pretty good for some amazing things. People are, are taking care of me. So uh, yeah, I gotta be I'm super thankful for everybody. Uh, this is my team, in my corner. Uh, I'm looking forward to putting a show and you know putting uh, putting a loss behind me. You know, it's, it's it's not something I'm accustomed to. It's not something that I ever want to get used to, and uh, I'm not losing anymore. Fuck that.